Hey, good morning. We are glad that you're joining us this morning online at Crestview. Uh, if you haven't, if you're first time, if you haven't met me before, I'm Pastor Sarah Jane. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're just so glad that you're here. This morning, we're starting a new sermon series on the life of David. Uh, so we're going to be in 1 Samuel. After a while, we're going to be in 2 Samuel. It's going to take us through most of the summer. We're starting this morning with the story of a woman whose prayer was answered. So if you're on Facebook, if you're watching on uh, our website, I would love it if you would leave a comment or send us a praise report uh, of a time in your life, maybe the most special time in your life when God answered a prayer, maybe the most recent time, maybe the most important time when God answered one of your prayers. Uh, I want to I read it. We want to praise God for it. We'll praise God for it in our staff meeting on Wednesday. Um, but, but just tell us about it. Uh, and, and maybe that'll, if you do that before worship starts, if you do it during worship, uh, let's direct our hearts towards the God who answers our prayers. And uh, let's join the people.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to Crestview. Welcome to worship. Welcome to God's house. We're glad you're here with us in person. We're glad that you're here with us online. Choir, we're glad you're here too. Yep. No Rodney, though. We're missing him today. He's at Myrtle Beach today, isn't he? Well, I was going to say he was going to miss out, but maybe he's not. (laughs) That's right, yeah. As always, there's a lot going on here at Crestview, and if you want to know all of it, uh, the Beyond the Bulletin is your friend. Um, I get it texted to my phone. Mm. If you want it texted to your phone, you can do that. If you just want to go to the website and click on it, you can do that too. But this week, there's vital information. I think there's vital information every week. Well, there's particularly vital information this week. Do tell. Because, Sean, an invasion is coming. An invasion is usually when an invasion is coming, you don't know in advance. So this is interesting, right? Well, well the invaders have very kindly uh, warned us in advance. Okay. Flamingos are coming. Oh, Tracy, I got it. Yep. If you want to avoid the flamingo invasion in your yard, you have to pay protection money. <laughs> this is not feeling right to me for some reason this morning, but anyway, we'll continue on. For the youth, Uh, this is a fundraiser for the youth. If you want to avoid the flamingos in your yard, you can pay in advance $20. Uh, If the flamingos land in your yard, it's $25. But you can you can move them to somebody else's yard. After that, you can pick who they're going to land on next. Gotcha. So you're forewarned. Forewarned Mm -hmm. is forearmed. Yep. Talk to Tracy. Before I do my announcement, I got to tell you before the service. So. Uh, Sarah Jane at Alexander, who we love. He's 11 months old as of when? Like last Two week? days ago. Two days ago. Mm-hmm. And so we were, of it, we were having our pre-worship meeting over here, and uh, she's holding him, and I said, Alexander, do you want to pray for us? And he went... <laughs> Typical preacher's kid. Yeah, we baptized Typical preacher's kid. We, we did the best we could. Yep, all right. So anyway, but uh, what's going on with me is uh, we got folks joining the church this coming Sunday, a week from today. If you're interested in Crestview, you want to chat with me about joining the church. I'd love to have you as a part of that group. And so our session will meet at 9 o'clock across the hall, and we'll be receiving new members and would love to add to that. So that's what's happening with me this week. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. Okay. Well, let's uh, move on now and prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God. We're going to be reading a little bit from God's Word, as we usually do, and then praying it back to God. Um, Since we're in... First and Second Samuel for the next 13 weeks, we're going we're gonna to read part of Hannah's prayer. Uh, so this is First Samuel chapter 2, uh, verse 1 and 2. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Let's pray. Lord our God, we give you thanks this morning that we do have the privilege of calling you not just God, but our God. Not just powerful, but kind and faithful to us. We give you thanks that whether we have been faithful or not, you are always faithful, like a rock that can never be moved. We give you thanks that whatever we get into, You are always holy, always pure, always waiting to pull us out and make us like you. And so we pray this morning as we come to your house by your invitation that you would make us holy like you, that you would make us able to offer you the worship that we were created to offer you. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you join me in the confession? 
Holy God, we join Hannah of old in praising you for your power to alter the condition of your creation. We praise you for being a God of redemption, recreation, and renewal. As your glory is revealed, every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. Rock of salvation, you give children to the barren and strength to the feeble. You exalt the poor and lift up the needy. We praise your holy name from morning to night, yet we build walls that separate us from you, from one another, from the world, even from ourselves. We place stumbling blocks in the way of goodness and truth. We are led astray by promises of earthly treasure. We confess our fallibility. Teach us to pray and to praise without pause, confessing hope ceaselessly. Guide us in our efforts to encourage one another, to work together for good in the world, and to prepare for the day of the Lord. Our hearts are sprinkled clean, and our bodies washed with the water of God's love. Through the gift of Jesus Christ, God assures us that we are pardoned, forgiven, absolved, and released from our sin. Thanks be to God. May your kingdom come. May your will be done.
Thank you, Scott, and choir, and Terry. It was early April 2015, and a man named Tom Tursich, who was 25 years old, a recent graduate of Moravian College in Pennsylvania, working for a solar panel company as an installer, decided that morning in early April to take a walk. And so he left his house and he began walking. His walk took him seven years and 49 days to complete. Tom decided he would walk around the world, and so he did, 28,000 miles, all by himself. Started out, like I said, in early April. He made it all the way to Austin, Texas. He found a stray dog. He named her Savannah. He adopted her and Tom and Savannah. Visited 38 countries, every continent except for Australia. They walked around the world. I read about him a couple weeks ago. It was the anniversary of his departure in early April. And the stories that he told were fascinating. He said that he was often in great physical danger. I mean, all by himself. He was walking around the world in these countries where people were not friendly to him. He said that he was threatened by knife point, by gun point. At one point he was arrested because it was suspected he was a spy spiders and snakes and wild animals but finally on may the 21st 2022 tom tersich made it back to haddon township new jersey and walked back in the house he walked out of seven years and 49 days previously and i loved reading the stories that he told about his journey and as i read about them there were two things that occurred to me one it occurred to me 
there are faster ways to see the world than to walk. You know, planes, trains, automobiles, ships. But he took his time. And the other thing that occurred to me was that the highlights for Tom were not when he reached his destination, but the highlights were in between destinations. It was during those moments of walking and journeying that he had the most incredible experiences and met the most incredible people. And I meditated on that this past week. Because often we do seem to be in a hurry, don't we? And we kind of go from thing to thing to thing, and often it's in between those destinations that God blesses us. I was with a couple friends of mine. I'm in a pastor's covenant group. So I've got these two friends, and we are brothers in the Lord. And we get together every year, and we communicate literally every day. We pray for one another, talk about what's going on with one another. We coach one another. And as we were meeting uh, down just outside of Spartanburg, South Carolina, one lives in Charleston, the other's in Asheville, and I'm, of course, here in Cincinnati. We were just talking about some of the books that we've read. And one of the books that we have really enjoyed was titled A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Oh, isn't that a beautiful phrase? Isn't that what life is all about? A long obedience in the same direction. And in that book, the author basically states that often in this country, and see if this is true for you, we want to go from religious high to religious high. We have to have these ecstatic religious experiences. But the truth is, it is often in just the everyday, the mundane, the day in and day out life that God builds our virtue and builds our character and builds our faith. I want to think about that with you today. Because the story we're looking at is a story about waiting. And the fact that it is often when we wait and God asks us to wait that He builds our faith in those moments. He builds our character and He builds our virtue. As uh, Pastor Sarah Jane mentioned, beginning today we're going to spend 13 weeks studying the life of King David. And today we're going to be looking at a text from 1 Samuel. But we'll be in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. King David, an interesting figure. Do you know that in the Bible there is more biographical information about King David than any other person except for Jesus Christ? King David represented Israel's heyday. I mean, that was their cultural heyday, their political heyday, their social heyday, their spiritual heyday. King David, that was the glory days. They looked back on King David like I look back on the 1980s. Those were the good old days, right? I mean, the 1980s, for me, full head of hair, 20 pounds lighter, an inch taller, two inches if I didn't cut my hair, you know? The 1980s, the Steelers had just won their fourth Super Bowl. Some of you can't identify with how that feels. It's a wonderful feeling. So, so for Israel, that was their heyday. King David, he lived about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. But he also represented Israel's future hope. They looked at him and his kingship and that throne and they realized someday God will reestablish that throne and reestablish his kingship. And so for 13 weeks, we're just going to look at the stories of David and study them and see how they intersect with our lives. We're going to see how he represents a pattern of salvation that we see later in Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at David and Goliath and David and Bathsheba and story after story. So that's where we're going to go. But before we get there, we first have to go before him to the life of Samuel. And so Samuel is, and we'll find out, a very central figure in the life of King David. And we need to understand who he was. And so Samuel was born maybe 50 years before David was born. And he became the prophet who would anoint David as king. Now you remember that... that, uh, Culturally and politically, the Israelites, during that time, they wanted a king. Do you remember that? They're like, give us a king. Everybody else has got a king. Why can't we have a king? They were in a period of judges. period of judges. Now, when you and I think about the judges, we think about the, you know, the men and women in the black robes who uh, decide cases. That's not who the judges were in biblical times. The judges were inspirational, uh, charismatic, political, and military figures that the people would follow. And Samuel is the last of the judges. 
we're going to read about today, he is also the first in the prophetic line that he began. So that's a lot of background, and, and you know me, I'll probably go over it 12 other times, but just want to make sure we are all kind of square with where we are. About 1,100 years before the birth of Jesus, the judges are um, descending, and ascending is now the monarchy. Okay? So let's just get down into it. We're going to just start where it all begins. 1 Samuel chapter 1. All right? There was a certain man whose name was Elkanah, and he had two wives. That's trouble. So Elkanah has two... I, careful, Sean, careful. Let me just say this, y'all. Polygamy is not the Bible's way, and it's not God's way. I mean, how many wives did God create for Adam? How many husbands did God create for Eve? You remember what God sa Jesus said? The Creator made them male and female, and for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be made one. God is not supporting polygamy when we read about it in the Bible. This story is just reporting what is fact. There's a guy named Elkin, and he's got two wives. It'd be like when you and I pick up the newspaper and we read a reporter telling a story of a terrible crime. The reporter's not advocating for the crime, he's just reporting it. So what we have here is, in Samuel, just a, a report. This guy has two wives. Now let's understand, it was an agrarian society, and it was governed by the aggressive use of force. And so what did a family need to be safe and to be fed? A lot of boys, right? And so polygamy kind of became that way. But I want to note this with you. Every time you and I look at the Bible and we see polygamy, there's trouble in the household. It is never portrayed as good for humanity. So Elkanah, we're just getting the report. He's got two wives. One was Hannah and the other Peninnah. And now we see some even deeper trouble. Peninnah had children but Hannah had none. And so you would immediately think, which of the wives is going to be Elkanah's favorite? Well, it's got to be Peninnah. She's the one with the children. She's the one who's providing for the society, for the, for the crop to be harvested. She's the one who's providing for the protection of the family. And on the other hand, Hannah is to be pitied. Because in that day, and again, we're talking 3,000 years ago, a woman's identity and value was wrapped up in her ability to provide children for the family. Children represented her security. If she had children, she was secure. You know, they didn't have 401Ks back then. You needed to have children in order to feel secure. So it's a sad state of affairs for her. No children, no value. Makes me kind of wonder for my own life, what is my source of value? What about you? Where do you derive your value in life? Well, Hannah, obviously, is struggling. That's the setting. All right, verse 3, here we go. Year after year, he went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. So Elkanah is a faithful person, isn't he? Year after year, he built worship into the rhythm of his life. You know? And that has to be pleasing to God. Makes me wonder, what about the rhythm of our lives? Is worship a part of that rhythm? Is it something that we do over time? You know, we all have a rhythm to life. We all have our patterns. It was uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, rather than going to Lulu's Noodles on Friday and getting my usual, I decided to go to Lulu's Noodles on Thursday. Because I'm, I'm crazy like that. And so anyway, went to Lulu's Noodles on Thursday, and Larry, the owner, said, Is it Friday? And I said, No. He said, are you having the usual? I said, well, yeah, I'm having the usual. He said, why are you here on Thursday? I said, well, I listened to a podcast, and the person on the podcast was giving marital advice and said, every once in a while you have to surprise your wife. And so I surprised her by getting the usual a day early that week. Free marriage advice right here at Crestview today. And there's more coming, by the way. Yeah, I know, uh-oh is right. But there's a rhythm to his life. You see that? And it, again, it makes me wonder, what is the rhythm of your life? What is the rhythm of my life? Do we build this in, whether we're here or whether we're at home? He goes there to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty. 
ooh, interesting, worship and sacrifice, they're linked here, aren't they? Now, you and I, we get worship. In fact, that's what we're doing right now. But what about sacrifice? What does that mean? I mean, no longer do you and I, we're not offering up any lambs or doves or bulls here. We're not doing that anymore. What is sacrifice for you and me now? Huh? Well, a couple of Bible passages. 1 Peter 2, five. We are called to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what is a spiritual sacrifice? Again, just, I'm kind of getting off the beaten path. I want to think about it with you, though. Psalm 107, and I'll give you these again. Verses 21 and 22. Prayer, praise, and thanksgiving are spiritual sacrifices. These are the things that you and I give to God as a sacrifice. We know, don't we, that God doesn't need anything. I mean, we read, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills belong to me. There's nothing you can give me I don't already have. What can you and I give God as a sacrifice? We can give Him our praise and give Him our thanks and give Him our worship. That comes from our heart and that is the sacrifice that we give to Him. Remember, that former animal sacrifice was fulfilled by Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So when we think about all the sacrifices in the Old Testament, that is a a foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. But there's still a sense, I think, that you and I are called the sacrifice to him. And so where do they go? They go to Shiloh. So that's where the tabernacle is. Shiloh was about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. In fact, if you go to Shiloh today, it's kind of the West Bank, it's not the safest place right now, you can still see the place where the tabernacle was located. And that's where they would go. And there were the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. And they were the priests of the Lord. It's interesting to me, and this is just a little aside, maybe one of you can help me with this. Those are Egyptian names, Hophni and Phinehas. And I'm wondering why the Hebrew priest has named his sons Egyptian names. I have to chase that down and figure that out. But this was a time when the priests were really corrupt. You know, you can look throughout church history and see where the clergy has been corrupt. Um, This is one of those times. And so now we have the scene set. So we've got Elkanah, He's going to go up there and he's going to worship. He's going to make his sacrifice. What does that sacrifice look like for them? Verses 4 and 5. All right. Well, the whole crew's in Shiloh. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give his portions of meat to Peninnah and her children. So they're getting their portion. Again, remember, this sacrifice involves blood, different from ours. And so they get what they're going to sacrifice. However... So the, the lady with all the children, that's what she's getting. Mm-hmm. Check this out, though. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Mm. He gave her twice her allotment. In other words, instead of just giving her one biscuit, he gave her two. You can tell I was in the Carolinas last week. Got biscuits and gravy on them. Gave her. That was supposed to be funny. Am I not going to be able to use that at 11 o'clock either? I don't have a pen on me either to write that down. Someone remind me, biscuit, no, for 11 o'clock. I thought it was clever when I wrote it. That's okay. So anyway, so he, but to Hanny he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. What a surprise. The one he loves is not the one who is providing for the family who has all the value according to the culture. No, the one he loves is just the one he loves. And then I noticed this, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it's not just happenstance. It's, just not, it's not just bad luck. Remember, the Bible doesn't teach luck. <laughs> it doesn't teach coincidence, right? Something is going on there. It's intentional. God had a purpose and a plan. Whoever's writing this is looking at the whole story and seeing God's hand at work. By the way, we believe, according to the Talmud, the Talmud is a collection of writings by Jewish rabbis geared to helping people fulfill the law and live by the law. According to the Talmud, it's believed that Samuel wrote the first 24 verses of this. But he didn't write any after the 24th verse. You want to know why? He dies in verse 24. It'd be tough to write any more. So it was probably picked up by Nathan after that. Anyway, there is this intentionality. God had closed her womb. God is up to something here. 
All right, let's continue on. Verses 6 and 7. Well, Peninnah is no angel. Uh, she's actually kind of cruel. I mean, she had to know Hannah's grief. She had to understand the lack of value and security. And rather than empathy, she does the opposite. I mean, I'm just imagining uh, Elkanah bouncing his children on his knee and Peninnah shooting glances at Hannah like, too bad you don't have any children for him to bounce on your knee. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking and irritating her. The word for irritate means more than just to annoy or get on their nerves. Rather, it is to roar or to thunder. In fact, as best I can tell, this is the only place in the Bible that word is used to describe a human emotion. It's usually like a hurricane or a storm. So we have this picture of Hannah being provoked, and there's literally like a thunderstorm in her stomach. Have you ever had that feeling? Just completely churned up and completely uneasy. This went on for years, not just a couple of times, years and years. And the, here you go. Whenever Hannah would go to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. She even provoked her at church. She even provoked her on their way to church. And have you ever, let's just back, have you ever in your life experienced Sunday morning as being stressful? Uh, just a kind of a stressful time? You know, I had a, a great friend of mine who was my personal physician and also a member of our church once tell me, he said, Sean, 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the least holiest hour of my week because I've had to get my family together and we're fighting in the car and we're trying to hurry. And I'm trying to get the kids out of bed and they're tired. They stayed up too late on Sunday night. Sunday mornings are really, really tough for me. And I mean, why wouldn't they be tough? God has an adversary who would love for you not to be here right now. He has an adversary who would love for you who are worshiping online to be watching cable news right now. He has an adversary who would love for us to be on the golf course or on the lake or in a coffee shop. Of course it's a difficult time. I told you I was going to give you a little marriage advice. Um, I gave you a little bit about spontaneity. You know, if you've got a usual, get it on Thursday instead of Friday. Here's some more. I want you to know, if, if you've ever had conflict in your family on the way to church, I want to explain to you how you can avoid that. My wife and I have never had one argument in the car on the way to church. Not one. We've never said a cross word to one another on the way to church. We've never been irritated with one another. We've never criticized the other's driving. I have never heard, Sean, you were driving too slow one time on the way to church. We have figured it out. You know what you've got to do? You need to drive separately. It works every time. Can I use that at 11? Okay, thank you. We don't say amen here, but we, we, we have our own way of saying it. So what's going on here? They're on their way to church, and Hannah is being provoked on the way to the house of the Lord, and she's weeping, and she's not going to eat. All right, move on. Verse 8. Elkanah wants to help, wants to make things right. He's going to search for just the right words to say. You know, he's tried the double portion thing. That didn't help, so he's going to try a new strategy. Elkanah would say to her, Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? He knows the answer because here you go. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? In other words, honey... I know you feel like you don't have any value. Honey, I know you don't feel like you have any security. But look on the bright side. You got me. Aren't you lucky? How lucky can one person be? I am the total package here. That's what he's saying to her, right? And here's what I notice. Hannah doesn't say anything back. Or if she did, it was not fit to be printed in this book, which is my guess, probably. Doesn't say a word back. Doesn't reply. So it makes me wonder, is there a place in my life where I am roaring and thundering? Where I'm experiencing this uneasiness? Because we're going to see in this next verse or two how Hannah handles all that. She's weeping, she's crying, she will not eat. Her husband's tried to give her a double portion, it doesn't help. He's tried to say, look at me, look how wonderful I am. You've got me all to your... That doesn't help at all. So what happens next? Verses 9 through 11. Once they finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. That language is intentional. It's decisive. It's focused. She's going to, stand, she's going to do something about this right now. 
And in weeping and bitterness, she prayed to the Lord. And I love that image. You know, sometimes maybe we have this image, when I go to God, I've got to say all the right words. I need to be as polite as I can possibly be. I need to dry my tears. I need to just be perfectly emotionally sound for this moment. Not true. When you and I are experiencing something that makes us weep and thunder on the inside, where do we do? What do we do? Where do we take it? We take it right to God. In weeping and in bitterness. Bitterness. She's angry with him. She understands that he has closed her womb. She's unable to have children. She prays to the Lord. And she made a vow. Wow. As I read the Bible, I can't find any place where God requires that we make that kind of a vow. Or we make that kind of a deal. Like, God, if you do this, then I'll do that. You know, we're in a desperate state, and we say, God, if you'll just deliver me for this one time, I will not miss church for a whole year. We, you know, God never asks us to make a vow. If you can find a place, I'd love for you to share it with me, because I couldn't this week. So she makes a vow, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery, in other words, see me here, God, and remember me and give me a son. Remember me. That language is all over the Bible. Psalm 106, remember me, O Lord, when you show favor. It doesn't mean God is forgetting. It doesn't mean God's having a senior moment. No, this is just the language of a human saying, God, will you keep and fulfill the promises you have made? And will you give me your favor? Show me the grace that only you can give. So remember me, give me a son, and now something's changed. Previously, she wanted a son for her own security and for her own value. Previously, she wanted to give Elkanah a son. Now look at the son. Then I will give him to you all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. She wanted a son. God wanted a prophet. And God had to get her in line with his will before he would deliver on his promise to her. No razor would touch his head. What's that mean? Interesting language. Why would you pray, pray to God and say, I'll give you a son and we'll never cut his hair? Are you familiar with the Nazarite vow in the, in the Old Testament? It's in the New as well. The Nazarites were a group of priests who were specifically set aside for a period of time to live exemplary, holy lives and be people of prayer around the temple or the tabernacle. The priests would abstain from all kinds of things that could make them impure, and they wouldn't cut their hair as an outward symbol that they had taken a Nazarite vow. Typically, someone would take a Nazarite vow for a couple months. It's kind of like it Lent. You're going to give up something for, for 40 days. A Nazarite vow was like, okay, for a couple months, I'm going to abstain from all this. I'm going to be holy and set apart for the Lord. In the Bible, we only read of three people who take the Nazarite vow for their whole life. Number one, Samuel. His mother is saying, he'll be a Nazarite forever, God, if you'll give me a son. Number two, Samson. Do you remember how Samson lost his power? What did Delilah do? Cut his hair. So there you get the symbolism. That hair represents that vow. And then in the New Testament, John the Baptist was a Nazarite. So if you will give me a son... I'll give him back to you. Again, at first she wanted a son for her. Now she wants a son for him. This son's going to be really special. Verses 17 and 18. Eli, the priest, <laughs> answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. You know, again, she didn't have a leather-bound Bible on the table. Eli's words to her were God's words. So God is saying to her, I've heard your voice, I've seen your weeping, I know your bitterness, I know your vow, okay, you go in peace now. You know, sometimes when we pray, well, think about this with me. When, when we pray, sometimes God says yes, right? Pray for something, God says yes, and we love that. Sometimes God says no. And sometimes God says wait. And I believe that it is in the waiting, when we are waiting on God, that we get in line with what God wants to do. When we wait on God, when God says to you, wait, He's trying to get you and me on board with His plan. He says, Hannah, I want you to wait because you're not on board with what I want to do with this son yet. So just think about that in your own personal life. 
If you are going through a season where you're like, God, I've been praying and praying and praying. I don't see an open door. I don't see a closed door. You're just telling me to wait. Maybe God is getting you in line with what he wants to do in your life and how he wants to bless you. So she says, well, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went away and ate something she hadn't been eating before, and her face was no longer downcast. She just turned it over to God. She trusted him. You know, again, she became aligned with him. I think one of the marks of faith is that often we, we believe God's going to do what he's promised to do before he does it, and we live like he's already done it. Isn't that faith? God, I know you're going to give me your favor in one form or another, and I'm just going to live like you already have. I think the more patient we become in prayer, the more we learn to trust, and the more we get on board. And then finally, here you go. We're, we're done now. All right? So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She had turned it over to God. She was aligned with God. Uh, she took the priest's word as God's word, and lo and behold, she conceived, she gives birth to a son. She named him Samuel. Here's that great person, that great man. After he was weaned, and in that day, that could be two, sometimes even three years. After he was weaned, she took, him to Sam, she took Samuel to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and she said to Eli, I'm the woman who stood beside you, praying to the Lord for this child. He granted me what I asked, and so now I give him to the Lord for his whole life will be given over to the Lord. It's interesting, she took him to the priest. You see, in biblical times, when someone had their prayer answered, they would go to the priest, and they would tell the priest the good news, and often they would make a sacrifice. Think about the stories of Jesus in the New Testament. Remember, he heals someone who's blind. He heals the lepers. What does he tell them to do? Don't tell anybody, but where does he tell them to go? You go show yourself to the priest. Fulfilling that old Hebrew law. And so she goes and she shows uh, her son to the priest. And here we go, and here we have Samuel. He would be dedicated to the Lord his whole entire life. And I just love the image here of Hannah being patient and waiting, transparent with God, and in those moments of waiting, becoming more and more aligned with what God wants to do. And I think the same is true for you and me. I'd like to invite you to pray with me now. And, and as we pray, let's think about maybe where God is asking us to wait. Let's, let's think about some folks in our church. Uh, I see Barbara, you're here. Cannon has been in the hospital. We'll pray for Cannon. Uh, my dad, many of you have been so kind to ask about him. The, the surgery uh, went well, but the after surgery has not been as good. So we'll pray for him and for my mother. And um, just whatever's on your heart, let's pray. Gracious God, we, we thank you again for this day and for your goodness and your kindness and your faithfulness to us. Lord, we acknowledge that maybe we're in a place right now where we're questioning what you want to do. And maybe we feel like we're in the in-between times. And our prayer is that you just open us to your will. Help us to become more and more aligned with you. Help us to get on your page and not spend so much time trying to get you on our page. Lord, we thank you for this church and the chance to worship you together. For all the various ministries we have, we pray that all of our ministries will point, point more and more people to you and grow us and mature us as your disciples. We pray for this community, Lord, where we are. We pray for this nation and for our leaders that they'll be wise and skillful and faithful. We, as always, thank you for this wonderful, beautiful world. We thought about someone this morning who walked around at 28,000 miles. And we're just appreciative of, of the great privilege and opportunity to live in this place. Lord, I ask now that you please hear all of our silent prayers which fill the hearts of these, your people. We make them one and all in Jesus' name. Amen.
okay, for 11 o'clock, I can't do the two biscuits for the double portion? Could I do like two helpings of getta instead? Would that be better? All right, we'll, we won't do that, but we will do the, the, the separate car thing, right? Definitely do that. Okay, good. Uh, and and uh, Barbara, do tell Cannon we're thinking about him. Uh, I love when I saw Cannon on, on uh, Friday. He was having some abdominal issues, and he confessed to eating four servings of potassio pudding before the ambulance got there. So I don't know if there was a correlation between that or not. But anyway, tell him that we love him and we're thinking about him. Uh, again, if you want to join the church or talk with me about it, uh, get with me this week. And friends, go in peace and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Both today and forever. Amen. Thank you.